This is for protection. This is Ubu. He sits really good. <laughs> anyway, sit Ubu, sit. Ha, ah, good boy. Hosh. <laughs> Generalized imitation and response class formation in children with autism. Young, Krantz, McClanahan, and Tolson, 1994. Again, an article from my birth, my birth year. <laughs> no, the year I graduated high school. Anyway, so winter, 94. So, um, I always start the articles off with, this is a good article. <laughs> this article sucks. <laughs> It doesn't suck. It's just tricky. Anyway, all right. So here we go. Notes. Um, they had four subjects. I, uh, some people call them participants. I, I like to call them subjects. Um, and if you're wondering why I have this, it got thrown at me in a previous video. So it's response prevention. Um, so we're shaping our shit. <laughs> I saw that coming <laughs> very slowly. <laughs> All right, so four subjects. Uh, we had a bunch of stuff. Anyway, so for those of you that don't remember what generalized imitation is, it is imitation that is generalized. So if you go way back to the Stokes and Bayer article and a video that we've recorded previously, um, we, they start hinting at the fact that maybe you can train generalization as its own response, maybe it's its own opera, maybe it's a response class, so on and so forth. So, okay, and then you get the whole response uh, 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 generalized imitation stuff that Bayer was working on, um, which we'll cover in another video, I'm sure. Um, and whoop, zip forward to 1994 and everyone goes, look, you could trade generalization as a response. And then some people are going, nah, probably not. Maybe there's some more limits to it. So they followed up on some of those limits, right? Um, so the limits seem to be, and they do a great literature review of this, um, by the way, um, including an article by my advisor that I didn't know he had written. <laughs> anyway, so there was a great article, or was a, a great review of the literature on basically how generalization, generalized imitation kind of fails and what's the limits of it. Uh, and in general, Mm. Sorry, that wasn't intended. They describe the scenarios where it is it fails because of um, that maybe the, the generalized imitation only happens across response to certain topographies, maybe. So like think of it as subclasses. Um, and I don't like to think of it as that sort of um, real or reified, if you will. I like to think of it as, okay, I, I understand maybe there's some limitations here. Uh, I don't like the term subclasses for a lot of reasons. It starts to make, starts to make me think of, uh, what do you call it? Um, step theories of change and uh, anyway. Ah, anyway. All right, so what do they do? Four kiddos. And they basically trained them to generalize. And they had several different response, uh, what do you call them? Topographies, if you will. Okay, so visual, uh, the vocal toy models, vocal to so that what did we have? We had vocal models, which was just a so my cookie, you help me, tie a shoe. That was for client number one. And Seth had, um, I ride a bike, you hug me, and do a puzzle. Heidi had, hi mowing, happy girl, eat cookie. All right. Um, so they had all those things, and then there was a d different one for David. Um, he got to do really cool ones. He had vocal toy models, so he got to play with. Uh, he got to play with his his whatever you call it. Anyway, so we would be playing with this and I was like, oh, ha, 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 woof, woof. <laughs> I, oops, maybe that's a generalization player. No, you get the idea. So he's playing with stuffies or playing with toys and boom, boom, boom. Oh, here you great, you woof, woof, woof. Whatever it is, right? So you're doing those sorts of things. You're playing with the toys and you're making vocalizations with them. And then they have, um, they do this for all these different things. Let's see, toy play models and then also pantomime models. Um, and they did them in sets. It was a really complex sort of study, but it was really cool. Uh, two thirds of the models were trained, right? So two, th uh, and then one third were probes. So you did a whole bunch of these things. They had um, 20 sets with 27 trials each, nine vocal, nine pantomime, and nine to toy play. So you'll have to read to get a little more detail out of that. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute because I got really frustrated when I was reading this article because I couldn't figure it out. I'm going to explain why in a minute. All right, so they looked at percent of match and non-match within six seconds of model. So if you present the thing, um, uh, the model, and then did the kiddo match or not match, did they, did, did they imitate within six seconds? Okay, um, and then again, the, pro the probes were, they're not going to reinforce you if you do it, um, and then the regular trials, the training trials, they're going to reinforce you. And they had different types of reinforcers. They were vocal and they added food to it um, for everybody. So, so model alone, I just went over that one, the model plus praise, um, but they added food with the verbal praise. Uh, and let's just get to the results of this. They're really cool. There's four gigantic <laughs> visuals in here. 
Um, and because of copyright issues, I can't show them to you, but I can look at them. Um, and wow, look at that. Oh, it's really clear. Um, so basically what you show is they, they show in there, I can show them here, but you just can't see them. They, that one right there. So there's four of these things. And what you have in the top half is the training scenarios and you have the bottom half is the generalization scenarios, right? So the, the probes, um, so the probe trials. So you, you should see in generalization that the, uh, when you are training them, you're getting more generalization um, and you're getting more copies. What, what was the term that they used? Um, more um, successes, more matches versus non-matches and it should switch over. They used a multiple baseline design. This is, it was great, right? They did a really good job and they got exactly what you would expect um, that you can get generalization within these things. Um, but what was really cool and what was interesting was that they were able to generalize their responses per each one of those things. Like I said, so the, the vocal model, right? Um, and then model, what was the other one? So we've got, oh, where's the scenario? Oh, so the toy play responses, like I was doing with this dog bear thing. Um, and then the vocal with toy. Uh, and then the promotion, or the um, pantomime responses, just no words, right? Just doing different things. And they were able to get these behaviors to generalize within each one of those classes, but they didn't get the generalization across classes, okay? That's where the cool part of this article is, is that they're showing the generalized imitation doesn't just go across the board. So each one of these rows in the multiple baseline here, these conditions in the baseline is the different classes. So you would get the generalization within, you can see it crystal clear, right? So all those different probes and prompts and stuff, but um, they did not get between. Otherwise you would have had the generalization happen before the intervention started, right? So during baseline you would have seen it. So anyway, they got it really consistently for all the kids. There's a big issue with one of the kiddos and needing some additional instruction, but that's beside the point of this article. So take home message from the article if you listen only to the article is this. Generalized imitation may be a thing, but it's probably limited to um, topographies of responses or tighter groups. It's not going to generalize outside of it. Your generalized imitation is limited is the point. Awesome. Love it. However, <laughs> I just, it bothered me. I had 17 cups of coffee this morning while I was trying to read it. Oh, I promised I was going to tell you something else. Um, I sat there and couldn't figure out why this article was important for a long time. Why? Because I didn't understand it. Repeatedly. I read this thing twice before this video. And I'm like, I don't get it. What, what's the big deal about this article? Because several people have recommended it and they were like, hey, you don't need to cover this. And it's a good article. But I couldn't get, couldn't get it. And it was because I missed one sentence. I had written it down on here, but I kind of missed the sentence when I was reading it and trying to understand it and integrate all this stuff into my verbal repertoire. And the, it was about how many different stimuli they tested and how they rotated it around, right? Um, so the 20 sets of trials, or they had 20 sets with 27 trials each, and those nine vocal, nine and blah, 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 that little section didn't click with me, matched up to the graph, and it finally went, boom, all right, made sense. So my point is, is that sometimes you get an article and you read it and you go, huh. And you move on. Don't forget, these things have been through a whole rigmarole of getting published. And why would something in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis get published and me go, huh, I think that my response was the wrong one. So I went back to the article, I reread it again, figured it out, found that sentence. Went, aha! The aha moment. So, all right, there you go. So we all make mistakes. So keep that in mind. Sometimes an article doesn't, you just don't get it for a while. So read it up again and see, and then pick different pieces of it and keep trying to figure out what the problem is. Last point, if you take the Stokes and Bayer article from 77 and you put it in the context of what they did, I kind of think that they didn't go far enough. Like, I think they they made their point that you generalized imitation and there's a limit to it. But if you take the idea of what's going on with generalized imit, with, with training for generalization and programming for generalization, maybe they just didn't train sufficient exemplars. Maybe you can get it to respond across response classes if you, or the response to topographies or something, if you train that, like, I just feel like, the, it, I know that there's more to it, and I know they've done more work, and I know that more work has been done, but one of the limitations that I saw, and I was like, I'm not going to completely conclude that you can't teach generalized, generalized imitation across the board based on this one article. There's probably some more out there that might back that up. They seem to reference a bunch that has evidence of that. However, I wonder if it's just a failure to program the technology effectively. Maybe. Anyway, another article. Bites the dust. Me and Ubu, we're going to go have fun. See ya.